Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host, Sana Makbul, with you at PTV World. In today's show, we will be taking a look at uh, today's developments uh, in the past few days. Of course, the situation in the country um, has uh, been uh, quite uncertain in terms of what is going on with regards uh, to the arrest of the PTI chairman and the former prime minister, which a day earlier was declared unlawful by the Supreme Court. And as the hearing resumed today, uh, there were a number of developments with regards to uh, the case of uh, Al Qadir Trust and others as well. Um, uh, we know that the uh, Supreme Court, uh, with regards to the arrest and the manner of the arrest uh, uh, from the Islamabad High Court, had declared uh, this uh, unlawful a uh, day ago in its order. And now, when the hearing resumed at the Islamabad High Court, uh, a protective bail has been given in three terrorism charges against uh, the former Prime Minister. And also, uh, it has declared that no arrest uh, is uh, going to be conducted uh, with regards uh, to uh, any of the cases registered against uh, Mr. Imran Khan at least the 17th of May. Furthermore, uh, the uh, issue with regards uh, to protective bail was also given for up to two weeks uh, with regards to the al Qaeda Trust case. And this is important in terms of the kind of developments we've seen in the past. Of course, uh, the decision uh, has been met uh, with celebrations of victory by the PTI supporters and followers. At the same time, we know that the PDM has criticized this particular decision uh, with the PDM chief uh, also speaking to media and talking about how uh, the uh, Pakistan a democratic movement is going to move forward with a peaceful sit-in outside the Supreme Court on Monday, which is May 15th, against the Chief Justice of Pakistan's decision and the way that he uh, has uh, exchanged uh, greetings with the PTI chairman as he was presented in the court yesterday, which is being highly criticized. Uh, it is also important, of course, uh, to note what is going to be the future strategy in terms of the kind of violence and damage that has occurred as uh, a reaction to the arrest of the PTI chairman, to which uh, the PTI chairman claimed he was unaware of and that uh, he was uh, within the courts and under arrest and so he did not uh, know and wasn't aware of what the situation is going on and he was also asked to condemn uh, the uh, situation and the kind of violence that has occurred to which he replied in the affirmative in the courts but again of course in terms of the kind of accountability uh, that needs to possibly exist in the statements that we've seen coming in previously from the interior ministry from the ISPR as well in terms of holding the miscreants accountable is now still a question mark especially um, in the aftermath of the order of the Supreme Court declaring the manner of the arrest unlawful. Of course, with regards to the proceedings of the case and what is going to be the future course of action, it is still uncertain as to how uh, the uh, PTI protesters and followers are going to react and the possibilities of uh, Mr. Imran Khan's arrest, to which he keeps on pointing out as well, uh, which is going to be uh, something that, of course, uh, is not uh, what the Islamabad High Court has allowed for. But in terms of the kind of question marks that are being raised to the credibility of the courts, it's important to understand what the decision is going to be with regards to upholding the Constitution and what can be the future legal course of action and the kind of political dynamics the country is. And of course, we also know that yesterday the Chief Justice, again, uh, moving beyond the jurisdiction of the courts, had asked the PTI chairman to uh, proceed with dialogue with the political parties. But given the current scenario, uh, this is, of course, something uh, that uh, is, a, is a question mark in terms of its possibilities and how uh, the uh, PDM and the ruling political setup is going to move forward with Pakistan Tariq and Saab. So we're going to take a look at all of these developments uh, legally and politically and try to understand what the situation is and how it's going to proceed in the coming days. For this and more, as always, in the studios, I've been joined by senior analyst Farooq Patafi. We've also been joined in the studios by Mr. Hafiz Hassan Ahmed Koker, who's advocate Supreme Court. And we've also been joined online by Ms. Aisha Jaskhan, who's a lawyer and a columnist. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for being a part of the debate and joining us today. Let me start with you, Hafiz Ab. The, of course, uh, decision a, a day earlier by the uh, Supreme Court declaring the manner of the arrest of the PTI chairman from the Islamabad High Court as unlawful is important in terms of understanding the developments of today as well. Uh, just yesterday, the decision of the court was being criticized as being biased uh, and uh, uh, for giving relief to the PTI chairman. But in terms of what has happened today and the kind of protective bail that has been given uh, to the former prime minister, uh, do you think it, it raises further questions to the credibility of the courts? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much. Uh, the first part uh, relating uh, uh, to the uh, order of the Supreme Court of Pakistan passed yesterday regarding uh, uh, declaring uh, the uh, arrest of uh, PTI uh, chairman as uh, invalid under the law and simultaneously uh, they have asked that you are released and you should appear on the next day and today it is the day when uh, uh, the PTI uh, chairman appeared before the court and there was uh, proceedings by the High Court. Now come to the first point. 
I being a student of law and uh, having uh, the experience and uh, heard about uh, certain, uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the legal formalities. The first legal formality is that ev even uh, if uh, you are accused, you are nominated in FIR and you are going to surrender before the court of law by applying uh, some bail application to the court and you mm -hmm. enter into the premises of the court then uh, you are within the premises of the court and no one and no authority can arrest you. This has been uh, doing uh, for the last many, many years in Pakistan, but unfortunately for the last few years, this is practice of the law enforcement agencies that while the people are entering or while the people are there, uh, the, uh, the police came and uh, they, uh, they arrested uh, uh, people. So the first time, uh, that is the judgment of the Supreme Court of Pakistan and no one can deny what the Supreme Court has hold regarding that uh, if someone enters into the High Court or the Supreme Court or the District Court premises, he is uh, appearing before the court. So you can't arrest him until you have uh, the authority or get permission from the registrar or from the concerned District and Session Judge or even from the Supreme Court of Pakistan. To this extent, there is no illegality and there is no such thing uh, which we may criticize uh, that uh, the Supreme Court order to the extent of declaring uh, the uh, arrest uh, of the PTI chairman right. was invalid. But it talks about the manner of the arrest. So does that mean that the arrest itself is also invalid because the it order doesn't say so? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. If uh, uh, it is clearly, it is clearly says that uh, he is, he was there on uh, that day for uh, 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 taking uh, the bail uh, before the high court in that particular case. Uh, and uh, while he was there, he was going for the biometric system and suddenly law enforcement agencies came over there and uh, they tried to arrest and ultimately he was arrested and finally the matter was brought uh, before uh, the Islamabad High Court and there was certain observation by the Islamabad High Court Chief Justice but finally he has hold two things. One is thing that uh, there was uh, 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 no issue with the arrest uh, of uh, the PTI chairman but simultaneously has ordered for the registration of case and initiated the contempt of proceedings. So meaning thereby the action of the law enforcement agencies was also presumed by the Chief Justice of Islamabad High Court that it was not done in a lawful manner. Mm -hmm. But that order was challenged by uh, 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 the accused or by uh, the nominated uh, in uh, the NAB reference, went to the Supreme Court of Pakistan and Supreme Court composed a bench by uh, three members bench, the Chief Justice, the former Chief Justice of Islamabad High Court and one from the Sindh High Court. So luckily there is no opinion and there is no criticism while composition of the bench but the only criticize what we are seeing uh, from the media is the proceedings conducted by the Chief Justice and with the accused, the way he has uh, spoken uh, uh, to the PTI chairman. So I regularly appearing before the Supreme Court and most of them who are politicians and they used to go to the Supreme Court and especially bank number one, the Chief Justice always says like this one day. Even from the different political parties, even first time when uh, the Bilawal Bhutto Zardari went uh, to the Supreme Court of Pakistan, even the, the sitting Prime Minister, when he appeared in 2013, uh, 22 uh, 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 SMC number one uh, of uh, 2022 regarding uh, this Qasim Suri's case, and then the political parties as well. So I think that uh, to some extent, that uh, as a Chief Justice, he should be conscious, but otherwise, he, if he has a uh, uh, the uh, the habit or he has the uh, I mean the way while he conducting the proceed and all of uh, the Supreme Court lawyers and even who are appearing before them they say that he is the most courteous Chief Justice of Pakistan. Okay, and and I'll talk more about this um, uh, the next time I come to you within the show, uh, Miss Aisha. The the decision of the Supreme Court yesterday and uh, the uh, what the Islamabad High Court has granted today in terms of protective bail to the PTI chairman, of course, is being celebrated by Pakistan Tehreek Insaf. At the same time, the courts have come under a lot of criticism uh, for giving relief to the PTI chairman um, as they have done before, particularly the Chief Justice. In terms of uh, the way that uh, the developments have been in the country in the past few days or so, um, and in terms of the way that we are seeing uh, the courts behave, do you think that there is an obvious bias uh, to what the situation is going on? And if it's that obvious and apparent, um, how is it that uh, the cases uh, are being proceeded with and how is it that we're going to ensure accountability? Um, um, yes, I think there's a very clear bias. Uh, I think there isn't even um, the veneer of impartiality on the part of uh, the Chief Justice. Um, I know your previous uh, guest said that he regularly appears before the 
Supreme Court and the Chief Justice tends to be courteous to all uh, politicians. Well, I, at the end of the uh, proceedings, he also wished him good luck. I mean, I'm not sure if does he do that with everybody else as well. Um, very clearly, kind of showed that he has a very soft spot and a lot of sympathy for Khan Khan, and not just by and how he conducted himself with him, but also in terms of the verdicts, the decisions that he gives regarding uh, his cases. Just the fact that he allowed ten people to. Uh, you know, even sleep in the guest house with him. I mean, I think that part is uh, minor, quite unprecedented. Uh, so, yeah, I think that there is a huge uh, disconcert between uh, the judiciary and the government from law enforcement, if you will. And this presents a very grave uh, issue in today because um, those who are implement the judgments are not at all on the same page as uh, the, the, the those who are giving the judgment. And then one can point out that even within the judiciary, there is a lot of dissent on this matter. The Chief Justice does not enjoy the confidence of at least almost half the half the Supreme Court justice. So he's going out on a limb to support one side in a very polarized environment. Uh, he is clearly becoming a party and not uh, not the role of the Chief Justice has to be completely impartial. So I would say that he is not conducting himself according to what is expected of him, not even perhaps everybody has a little bit of a bias. Here the bias is almost touching the screen. So it does become very difficult not only have accountability, but to proceed in, de in a democratic way. Uh, regarding uh, his arrest from the court premises, of course, that was not an ideal way or a, not a good way to arrest him. But one must also bear in mind that he resisted arrest several times. And his uh, party workers were throwing petrol bombs and whatnot at law enforcement the first time that they had come to arrest him. So whenever he was going to be arrested, there would have been high drama. There would have had to have been some uh, inconsistencies within the parameters of the law. Unfortunately, he doesn't believe in playing by the rules of the law. Then that puts the, the law enforcement in a very precarious, awkward uh, because how do you arrest this man we have come to court with hundreds of supporters makes everything turns everything into a, 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 you know a very um, uh, filmy drama almost uh, and it, it will have to be it, it's very it's a very difficult situation right absolutely um and and i want to talk a bit more about uh, this farooq with regards to um uh, the impact that this is going to have on how the situation is going to unfold because i understand at one point we are talking about uh, the the biasness or the impartiality um, uh, the the partiality of the courts but in terms of uh, the way that the uh, the these decision with regards to the pdn staging a, a protest outside of the supreme court or with regards to how the situation is unfolding it seems that whatever the islamabad court of course uh, has granted is still being respected or whatever the supreme court has said is still sort of being carried out in terms of what's going on how how are these two two things going to be aligned if at one point we are questioning the basis of what the orders are coming out of the courts and at the same time they are sort of being followed through ah you have changed the question for me right uh, but uh, allow me to actually comment on what what was said earlier including what you said Imran Khan Saab earlier uh, indeed actually made that call for nationwide strike and a peaceful strike, so, uh, so to speak, until he, he is freed. And um, I just got an update that he is on his way to Lahore now. So uh, you can actually, uh, all people who were actually listening to the first call can actually uh, go back home and rest because their leader is going back home despite everything. While the entire country goes through hell, he will sleep in his bed. Um, um, uh, regarding, uh, uh, you know, what uh, our worthy colleague uh, here was saying, and I, I wanted to actually say that uh, if I were Chief Justice of Pakistan, I would at least uh, call him up and thank him for this, uh, you know, passionate defense of the CJ. 
In fact, it was so honest and so kind a defense that it actually overlooked what was written in the uh, uh, judgment yesterday. Uh, I mean, I, I totally get this myth about sanctity of courts and all that. Usually it is thought that if you want to attain somebody who is actually, uh, you know, not being attested or who is defying any kind of arrest, uh, the best way is to go to courts because they have to be present there. So that's why police and authorities usually actually address them. But yesterday's order did not actually mention this or whatever, um, uh, you know, Hafiz was saying. Uh, uh, it it uh, quotes Article 4, Article 7, Article uh, 9, 10A, and 14. I wish uh, it had quoted another article, that is Article 15, which might not exist in our constitution, but it is uh, usually rumored that in the uh, African countries, it is uh, um, a law, or it is thought to be a law, which says fend for yourself. Sana, um, uh, honestly, I did not remove Imran Khan from power. I did not install this government. I did not install Imran Khan. But it is uh, uh, with a grave heart that I have to say that as a common citizen, I have to pay you know, uh, uh, the heavy price of whatever is going on. Today, my daughter's exam was there, uh, O-level exams, and that was canceled. Uh, similarly, throughout the day, actually the past three days, we have, whenever we come out of the house, we cannot access internet. It was just restored in another breaking news, by the way. Mm. But with all these things happening, I mean, uh, you want me to actually spare uh, any bandwidth for, uh, you know, future protests which will actually <laughs> further complicate the issue. Uh, frankly, uh, today what I was expecting was that we are going to hear from a bench. Uh, then we learned that it is not essentially a bench, it is a bar and it is an open bar. You can drink as much as you want. You can get the vegetable buffet of uh, all the reliefs, uh, uh, reliefs that you can ask for. One court, second court, third court, court is sitting. Uh, Imran Khan says that I will not leave till the time I don't get final judgment and then he gets final judgment. Then he is asked to, uh, you know, uh, condemn whatever has happened in the past three days, especially May 9th. And then, because uh, uh, there was fi firing opportunity outside, I don't know whether it was true or not, but there were reports, right? Because of that, perhaps police, for his safety, kept him uh, within the, uh, you know, premises of the High Court, Islamabad High Court. Amazingly, uh, on one side, he is being asked to condemn uh, the, the attacks and protests. In the next breath, he is calling for another strike. So, I mean, uh, for frankly, with all this, uh, you know, tamasha that is going on, I think we all deserve this. And let me say, congratulate uh, the entire country's elite, which, by the way, includes Hafiz Saab as well. You have won. This country is going to remain the way it is because we are going to always justify whatever the powerful do. Right, and um, Havis, I'm sure uh, you'd like to respond to that as well. But let me add to that also in terms of uh, the merits of the case in itself as well, because they were also challenged in the courts today, and even yesterday in the order, like we're repeating again, it, the the arrest itself wasn't discussed. The manner of the arrest was there, but in terms of um, whatever uh, the inquiry is uh, proceeding with, and the kind of charges against the BTA chairman, there was also the issue of whether or not uh, the warrants uh, can be issued um, if the inquiry turns into an investigation and. It seemed that the um, BTS lawyer was um, adamant that that wasn't the case. But in terms of um, where we stand uh, among the many cases against the BTI chairman and this particular one, a lot of the um, community, the legal community was talking about how clear uh, this case is in terms of what it says. But despite that, what we're seeing today seems to be a development in the other direction. Why is that? Can you help us understand the merits of the case there as well? Two, there are two aspects. And I know the anxiety and the concerns uh, which is shown by my colleague uh, in his uh, uh, statement and he's saying. But two things are very important. One is who is the loser in all this particular situation. The loser is the country and the people of Pakistan. What is going on in Pakistan? for the last one year and uh, if we compare the history of and Pakistan. And is there a winner by the way? Th the winner who those are who are in power and who enjoy the system and who are in the status quo, they are actually those people and, and they are the responsible. 
the people of Pakistan at that time, there is uh, a serious issues with the law and order. There is serious issue with the justice system in Pakistan. There is a serious issue in the governance system in Pakistan. And there are certain serious issues with our economy in Pakistan. And the economy situation is that, that we have around uh, more than 50% uh, inflation in Pakistan. And then we have the highest, uh, uh, I mean, the food inflation in the region. And the other problem is that with our country, the, with the problem is with our currency. And we have seen for the last two days that uh, the currency has fallen into 14 rupees against the dollar. And uh, it is the most uh, in the region, it is the unpredictable currency, which is uh, the rupee of Pakistan. So in this particular scenario, when there is no investment, where there is a gr great perception about uh, the law and order, and then uh, simultaneously with the economy and the political situation, the ultimate loser are the people of Pakistan. The people who are struggling for their lives, the people who are on street, the people who are, I mm. mean, uh, the lower middle class or the middle class even, uh, these people are, I mean, now feeling the heat uh, of this uh, political instability and uh, the constitutional instability in Pakistan. So this is a fact and uh, this fact can't be denied uh, by me or somewhere else. These have been reported by the local media, the international media and the analysts as well. Now what should be done uh, to move forward? The move forward is that we should come out as a country or as a nation to this constitutional and political uh, uh, crisis and the responsibility lies with our political leaders because we have a democracy and democracy is the name of a dialogue. If you can't dialogue with other and you can't resolve your political or constitutional issues in the parliament, then the same thing is going on. And when the same thing is going on, then there is no investment, there is no employment in the country. And uh, I mean, so that so many children in schools in thousand, my uh, uh, daughter has also not gone to the school because of two, three day strikes. And ultimately, all these negative areas affects uh, the mind of mm. the people of Pakistan. And this is a very serious issue. Now I hope and I appeal and I, I have been repeatedly saying uh, before the media and in my writing that the responsibility lies with our leaders, all the political leaders. They should get together for the sake of the country, for the sake of the people of Pakistan, resolve their issue, don't bring their political issues into the high court and to the supreme court supreme court the high court is not meant for the political issues of the country if you go there someone happy someone is not happy and if someone is not happy they criticize the conduct of the judges and ultimately when you bring down uh, these things to the media the even the confidence of the common man would also destroy on it so the let's uh, i hope uh, that all the political parties they come on the point, on the broad agenda, they come on the governance, economy, social justice, and uh, the, uh, 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 the education sectors, the huge population we have. Uh, we are the largest, fifth largest country of the world. We have simultaneously, um, I mean, you are saying that uh, the, uh, the food uh, uh, it's security is a big issue in Pakistan. Being the agriculture country, we are importing everything outside Pakistan. So let's try and let's hope uh, that uh, all the political issues, the constitutional and uh, the differences between them, because they political leaders and the political parties ultimately, if Pakistan exists, they, they exist. And if the stake of the Pakistan is not there, no political party, no such leaders, no will appreciate, and the history will remember, not in a good words. Right. Um, I mean, Saisha, the uh, PDM, of course, uh, has talked about uh, uh, to, to staging a, pro a protest sit-in outside of the Supreme Court on Monday. Um, and I understand, of course, uh, that uh, the, the, where, where this is coming from and what the concerns are, the parliamentarians before also, uh, with regards to the decisions and the benches of, of the courts have uh, expressed their displeasure uh, with regards to what is happening but in terms of the way uh, that things have uh, happened in the past couple of days and the kind of relief that we're talking about do you think that this strategy or is this response makes sense and is appropriate in terms of what's going on I want to also understand in a broader term um, when when the game perhaps is tampered with and is flawed does it make sense to follow the rules um, in terms of your question about does it make sense to have uh, a, a counter strike, if you will. Um, I don't think it does because I've always had the position that um, if you're in government, then you shouldn't be striking or doing uh, protests. I mean, this was the way of Imran Khan and uh, the PPI, and I don't think that this needs to be replicated. 
um, particularly in, con- in the context of what happened uh, in the last few days. Uh, because of all the violence and anarchy that we saw, I think calling for a counter strike will only complicate matters, make them more violent, make the possibility of two different groups clashing with each other, which could be even more detrimental for uh, average citizens. So, no, I don't agree with that call. Uh, your second point, um, before I come to that, I would just like to address uh, a little bit of what was said earlier in terms of the instability that's been going on for the last year. I don't think that we can only focus on the last year. I think we need to go back in time a bit longer to figure out why we are in the position that we're in. And I think one of the key reasons is that the army has been meddling in political affairs. And every time they create a political force or prop up a politician, uh, thinking that this person will do our bidding or this party will uh, will advance our interests. It has always come back to bite. It has never been good. It has always reached the point within three to four years where there has to be a split between the politician who was their blue-eyed person and and their uh, and the institution. The difference this time, however, is in the past, uh, the, the politicians just quietly left and waited their turn, waited for the situation to change so they could uh, ingratiate themselves to the army again and garner their support to come back to power. But with Mr. Imran Khan, the loose that he is, and some of us were warning the army about this, a few years ago when they were trying to prop him up at all costs that this will not end well for you. Uh, they didn't heed our advice then. And now they are in a much, much worse situation because no other political party resorted to violence like this. I mean, you can see certain terrorist organizations like the PTP or the TLP resorting to violence like this, burning ambulances, burning schools. But you can't see it with the PPP or the PMLN, no matter, even when their leaders were hanged, when they were assassinated, when they were exiled, when they were jailed. I mean, nothing much has happened to Mr. Imran Khan in comparison to that. And in the past, the judiciary and the army were always on the same page against the politicians. This time, there's a split between them. So he has support from the judiciary as well. But in spite of that, his supporters feel so entitled, and they feel that the only way is for their man to be in power, and that's why I don't think dialogue will work. As much as I understand and I sympathize with people, uh, your guests in the studio who are in Pakistan and I am not, and they are directly impacted and I am not, but looking at it from the outside in, I don't think dialogue with a party like that, who has Washed earth policy, it's either me or nothing, everything burns to the ground. I don't think you can resort to dialogue with that. What you right. can hope right. for. And Natasha, you've, you've spoken about how the call uh, uh, is not something that you think is the appropriate forward, and uh, you're also saying that dialogue uh, is also uh, not something which seems to be an option with this political party. Then, what really is the alternative for the current ruling elite to proceed with regards to PTI? That's exactly what I was coming to. I think the, the only way forward would be a truth and reconciliation process where the army must take the lead, not the politicians. The army must take the lead and confess to what it has done wrong in the past public. Instead of just talking about, just laying blame on others, everybody needs to introspect. Mr. Imran Khan, if he is serious about politics in Pakistan, or if he's serious about Pakistan itself, must also confess how he received military support to come to power four years ago. How And now, because he doesn't have that support, he's turning on. And the army must also confess how it, in different stages of Pakistan's history, they have meddled with politics, and they have used propaganda against politicians unfairly. And then, of course, the other politicians must also confess whatever they did wrong. One, we will not be able to move forward as a country. We will not get stability. We will, our economy will not improve unless everybody 
owns up to the mistakes that they have made and then rest. Right, absolutely. Um, and Farooq, this is an important point also in terms of uh, what we have seen in the past few days uh, to be seemingly the perception of the way people have reacted or have spoken about and how previously PTI has also spoken about uh, the establishment's involvement in political affairs, even though we have seen statements coming in uh, from the military establishment of their decision not to take part in any uh, political affairs and to stay away from it and also ha have uh, spoken to political parties and leaders uh, to let that also be a uh, way forward but in terms of uh, how we would like to proceed with the credibility of our institutions with the sanctity of our institutions and the way that the public also looks at them and understands what's going on and then of course our political leaders to also take account for their own actions and proceed with legal avenues uh, who is it really who's going to make sure that all of this is sorted and that lines are not crossed you you have used a beautiful term that is legal avenues pray tell me which legal avenues when a court is doing what exactly it is doing, right? And I'm talking about this uh, uh, superior most uh, body of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, um, uh, um, legal matters in the country. Mm. Where else can you go? There's no legal recourse, right? Um, uh, particularly when you talk about CJ, I was just pointing out, uh, pointing out about yesterday's judgment that with all those, uh, you know, articles that were mentioned, there's no citation of any law that even defines what constitutes, uh, co constitutes the premises of a Supreme Court or High Court, right? Uh, you cannot even cite a law that, that would mean that they, none actually exists. So what exactly is happening now? The Supreme Court again is legislating through fiat and that continues, right, Sana? Uh, there's one thing. The second thing, this fetish about, you know, holding dialogue and w I tell you, when one party is misbehaving, what are you telling people to do? If you are asking them to go back and talk to them, you are essentially asking them to, you know, surrender. Is it not true that India, Pakistan, whenever we face off each other, the world has this pressure on us that we have to actually uh, ignore their microaggressions all the time? Is it not true that the people who actually keep on advocating that we have to talk to TTP actually uh, are asking us essentially to ignore the assassination of 80,000 Pakistanis? Is it not true that people who are asking the government or the ruling alliance to actually, uh, you know, go uh, reach out and talk to PTI, uh, but they are asking them to ignore uh, and essentially multi power put mud on uh, the way a, a building was uh, set on fire in Lahore and the way GHQ came under attack. I mean, uh, uh, regarding institutions, how to ensure the respect of institutions. Sana, nobody died and made me take it out of, take it out of the entire country. The, you know, uh, the respect of every institution is in their own hand. It is not in my hand, right? I, I cannot actually uh, attribute, uh, give to an institution, but it cannot earn on its own. And I'm talking about the court. Now, let us talk about the army and the, uh, you know, uh, military establishment. The irony is that uh, everyone keeps on criticizing the army, right? And I know we have this uh, really patchy history and army has taken over this country three, four times. And that is not all. Uh, General Bajwa is a gift that keeps giving. So, uh, similarly, General Faz's legacy also keeps on haunt, haunting us. But, you know, um, uh, there's the saying that Subha ga bhula sham ko ghar aja hai, to bhula nahi kate. If somebody who's lost comes back home in the evening, you don't call, uh, you know, consider him lost. Uh, the thing is that for 20 years, army has been fighting for, uh, uh, for against terrorism and it has laid sacrifices. And today I can talk about how uh, there are elements who might have supported the Afghan Taliban, but the fact is, on which side are those elements? Are they actually ruling the country or they were supporting the people who actually set fire to the core commander's house? These are the questions that we have to ask. Mm. When the army has in principle decided that it is going to stay away from politics, and when it has decided that it is going to ensure that the country actually behaves like a nation state, not a jihadi camp, right, base camp or jihad, 
then if somebody criticizes it, uh, and I'm not talking about the cotton company, I'm talking about international media and all the skeptics, the biggest problem then becomes that you don't want any corrective measure, right? Right now, what we are struggling with is that there was an old order. It was, uh, a, you know, absolutist, fundamentalist, extremist order. And then General Musharraf came and tried to actually maneuver a way out of that situation. Hmm. We have been struggling for 20 years. But now when we came close to, you know, some kind of victory, there has been an uh, incredible pushback. And because there's pushback, pe now people say, okay, let them sort it out. If they fall, let them, let them fall. We will uh, deal with whosoever actually then takes over. This is the irony of this moment. And if I could tell you the kind of stories that I keep on hearing of sacrifice even now, because people right now is, are still targeting our state institutions, Sana. And uh, it is true even of this day. So what are we going to do? Right, absolutely. Um, and Hafizam, I want to also talk a little bit more about the, uh, the the way that the protesters and workers of media have reacted because we keep on uh, referring to also how uh, public uh, buildings were targeted, of course, state institutions were targeted. And that seems to be the sentiment also uh, that uh, is motivating the people uh, to make uh, such, uh, to consider such actions and take such measures. But in terms of accountability, we heard the ISPI, we heard the political setup also talked about how the miscreants will be held responsible. But especially Especially in light of uh, the Supreme Court declaring the arrest illegal, um, we were just talking yesterday about this. Where does this somehow or the other uh, make uh, any impact on the accountability of the people who have uh, uh, who have created uh, uh, this ruckus in the country, who have set fire to buildings? Because uh, then it becomes a question of how somebody was reacting to something now that the court has declared illegal. What is the accountability process way forward in this, and whether or not the PTI? chairman is absorbed of all responsibility because he keeps claiming that he was unaware of the situation and so how could he have stopped it? The violence on street, the protesting uh, on uh, their demands by misusing uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the law and uh, particularly raiding on the government and private building is not acceptable at all. And if someone violates, uh, he needs to be punished at earliest possible so he should be given a lesson that no one dares because this is our country and there are certain limitations. If you have a fundamental rights uh, in the constitution you have a right to uh, speech and you have a right to make uh, the association and you have a right to uh, say whatever you want to say but there are certain limitations as well. You can't cross uh, such limitation. You can't cross in a way that uh, you ultimately, I mean, uh, damage uh, the public property or uh, the uh, the private property, and uh, you try to halt uh, the uh, uh, the situation on roads. The schools are closed, uh, the streets are closed, and we are saying the internet is closed, and no one is there. I mean, uh, 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 to uh, in a way to have a normal life uh, in Pakistan. So this is not acceptable. So this is the one thing. And uh, the law enforcement agencies should uh, I mean, identify those people and take action strictly in accordance with law, whosoever would be. And, uh, and, and there is no uh, uh, second opinion on it. But simultaneously on the other side, being a student of law, I am seeing uh, this situation on the legal and constitutional side. The legal and constitutional side is that we have a constitution in Pakistan and still uh, we all the people of the four provinces believe that this is the best document and this particular document there are certain roles defined in the constitution there is uh, the parliament which is a supreme institution in Pakistan as per constitution then there is the executive uh, and then there is a judiciary and very well defined uh, by the separation of powers in our constitution and then there is a uh, provincial autonomy in constitution along with the, the Islamic provisions in law. <laughs> so importantly, the most important thing that, that uh, if uh, we believe uh, that this is the best document, then all matters should be resolved uh, in the parliament. The parliament has to uh, lead uh, in this exercise and resolve this issue. If mm. uh, we don't, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, resolve these issues in parliament or don't resolve these issues uh, by these political parties, 
ultimately there would be a chaos and criticizing on every point that uh, Pakistan is doing this one, that uh, criticizing on the roles of the certain institution, this is not the absolute approach. Now we move to forward uh, on this exercise, the how we can, uh, I mean, take away Pakistan and the people of Pakistan from this constitutional, political, economic situation and the only liability rest with those people who are at the helm of affairs. They should take lead, exercise their powers in the larger interest of the country, whether they are sitting in the establishment, in the judiciary, in the parliament and the political parties, because these five, seven percent, they are, uh, they are actually, they can, I mean, the change the situation for the whole of Pakistan. Otherwise, if we are criticizing each other, the conduct, the people, the political parties, there is no such resolution. Okay. And this is a time to resolve these issues in the larger public interest of Pakistan. Right. And most importantly, to curtail and minimize uh, the tenure of the parliament as well, the National Assembly, the Provincial Assembly. So it is another hurdle that after every three years, there is a problem and right. then certain institutions came forward and the Prime Minister is ousted. So there is a three years parliament rear for the whole of Pakistan. Right, absolutely. I understand that. Um, mm -hmm. Ms. Sasha, the, the the way that the um, the way that the protesters have reacted is being looked at um, uh, as perhaps uh, a build up of uh, the many years the way that the situation has unfolded in Pakistan and of people being aware of how uh, politics are run in the country and this is their reaction coming out but there's a lot of uh, footage that we have seen which sort of points otherwise in terms of a deeper understanding of the issues of the country and the way that uh, things are going in terms of uh, the depth of what uh, what the people uh, seem to understand and the scale at which this perception exists do you think that the the public at large is actually aware of what's going on and that is why we've seen uh, such protests spring up the public is extremely polarized so so one person's reality is completely alternate to another depending on which side um i just want to clarify that i don't think anything justifies the violence that we saw and those people who are responsible for that violence must be punished with a very strict uh, hand. But unfortunately, I don't think that's what has happened. I think there was a huge security lapse. I mean, a lot of people in Pakistan have grievances against the army for various reasons. But none of that justifies what happens happened, for instance, at the core commander's house in Lahore. But as a Pakistani citizen, I am quite outraged that there was no security to stop those people from coming in. That is a very clear security lapse. So I think the comment that was made earlier that Subhaka Bhula Gharaja, whatever, I don't even believe in that saying, but there cannot be, you cannot just suddenly say, we're not going to be meddling into politics and everybody takes your word for it, given a very different and dark history. One cannot move forward without taking stock of what's happened in the past. And if one talks about accountability, you either have to have it for everybody or for nobody. You can't say that we will have accountability for politicians, but we won't have it for generals or judges. But that's a separate matter. Nobody as a Pakistani citizen or a concerned Pakistani citizen, we don't want to see attacks on our army. But we, th that is completely separate from saying that the army must take stock of the mistakes that they made in the past and that they must uh, you know, seek to make amends or it must be seen that they are making amends on that front. What happened at the core commander's house, this is a big question mark, and this needs to be answered. Uh, I think there needs to be a purge in every, in, in every institution, not in, in amongst, you know, if, if those who are responsible for allowing these people in, there, there must be very strict action against them as well, because a core commander should have very strict security. I mean, he's at that sensitive post. In terms of the sacrifices that the army has made, nobody is denying that, but there's also a lot of sacrifices that the civilians have made. There have been a lot of civilians that have died in the war on terrorism as well in Pakistan. So I think as a country, we have made sacrifices and it is still very, very sad that we are not clear on how to deal with that threat. And in fact, not being clear on how to deal with that threat has led other people like PTI replicating the same, uh, you, you know, modus operandi, the same, the way that terrorists behave. That is how now the, this party is behaving as well, because the state never took a very strong stance, unfortunately, despite all the sacrifices that were made by civilians, by the army. 
And I, you know, have to say one other thing sitting outside of Pakistan and just looking at how the international media is looking at this and how other countries are looking at this. I think so far there has been very tempered statements, which is good. They are saying that this is Pakistan's internal matter and Ran Khan doesn't have much support abroad in any country. Nobody is yearning for him to come back other than his own supporters in Pakistan and in the diaspora. But in terms of foreign governments, nobody is concerned that he is being arrested or anything like that. But if what happened at the core commander's house makes, had, makes the news abroad, we are a nuclear nation. And, you know, it has always been said that are, are the nuclear uh, weapons safe in Pakistan? If they see, say, see, see, sorry, see scenes like that where the core commander doesn't have security, questions will be raised about the safety of the nuclear weapons. And that is very serious. This is, this is We're short on time, so I'm just quickly going to move on. Farooq, anything you'd like to add before we go? Yeah, but yes. I just wanted to clarify, don't hold any brief for the army. Uh, I wasn't saying that uh, you shouldn't be holding anybody who meddled in uh, politics uh, accountable. I, in fact, I could criticize General Bajwa and General Fair simultaneously, right? Uh, the wh whole point is that one has to understand that there is a turnover in army, which is uh, which has discipline. So everyone who is a culprit might retire sooner or later. The, the point at this moment is when you're looking at these institutions, uh, you know, it is like criticizing today's leadership for General Bajwa's excesses is like uh, criticizing my daughter for whatever bad things I might have done. So this is what I was trying to point okay. out. Uh, but very quickly, Savio Lahori, uh, our friend who was here in the program yesterday, actually has sent me a draft of a bill. And that is very good. I think uh, it makes perfect sense. He says but, uh, there should be a law, uh, and he has drafted it, which should be called Protection of Imran Khan Act 2023. And it has meticulous details as right. well. So uh, wh one more thing. Somebody else actually also texted me just now that there is a program in India called the Indian Matchmaker. Uh, there should be another uh, called Pakistani Matchmaker and our CDS should feature. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Farooq. Thank you, Hafiz, for joining us. Thank you, Ms. Aisha, for being a part of the debate. That's all we have from the show, and we hope that there are better days coming soon. Have a nice weekend. We'll see you Monday.